hello everyone. Uh, today we have the great honor to have Peter Johnson from Zapata talk to us. And uh, Peter will be talking about some tricks one can use to run NISC uh, algorithms on the comp quantum computers that we have today. Uh, thank you, Peter. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Marga, for the invitation. Um, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, yeah, I guess first I want to say uh, I'm like particularly excited um, to be giving this talk at Sydney um, because uh, a lot of this work was inspired by work done at Sydney or by people now there. Um, so um, hopefully we can get into it a little bit in the question and answer session. Um, excited to learn from you. Um, okay, so let's see if I can advance my slides. No. Okay, so I'll be speaking about work um, that I did with a few colleagues on the research team at Zapata. Um, and uh, the, there are two preprints about this work that you can find on the archive. Um, and so uh, just to, to set us in the right, um, in the right context for this talk, um, I want to invite you all to the headspace that we were in uh, when we began this work. So uh, you oftentimes at Zapata, we're thinking about what can you do with today's NISC quantum computers or today's noisy um, devices that are available. In this work, we are actually thinking about um, future quantum computers, quantum computers that are likely to be commercially useful. And in particular, thinking about this moment where these devices uh, start providing commercial value. So we refer to that as quantum advantage. And uh, I guess the protagonist of this story will be the quantum advantage machine. So really the question that we're after is, um, what might we ask of the quantum advantage machine? And um, what techniques need to be developed in order to um, enable the device to achieve those tasks quickly? So um, why might you be interested in a quantum advantage machine? Um, okay, maybe not you in particular, but many people are interested uh, in this device because of its application to a number of areas in industry, materials, finance, um, or logistics. Uh, today's devices, although extremely impressive, um, have some ways to go before they will are likely to achieve quantum advantage in any of these areas. Um, why is that? Um, for many reasons, a few of the reasons are that the number of qubits these devices have available are too few um, for solving many industry problems of, of relevance. But maybe more importantly is the fact that these devices are um, quite noisy. Um, and so the the uh, progression that we will be most interested in is the improvement of the um, logical operations on the devices. Um, and this may come through improved engineering or by impl implementing various fault tolerant um, quantum computation techniques. So um, over the last uh, maybe almost decade now, um, there has been a new thread in the field of quantum algorithms where people have been designing quantum algorithms which cater to the limitations of these noisy devices. So we refer to these algorithms as near-term algorithms. You probably recognize some of the acronyms here. Um, these algorithms um, cater to these uh, noisy devices because they are often robust to error. They use short depth quantum circuits um, and they often offload much of the computation onto 
a classical, uh, a classical computer. So um, thinking back to the quantum advantage machine, we can ask ourselves, do any of these uh, near-term algorithms show promise towards becoming the application for realizing quantum advantage? So um, the main thrust of this talk is to suggest that um, we still need some dramatic improvements of the algorithms themselves um, in order to achieve quantum advantage. And we'll be focusing on one technique, um, which is applicable to a number of these algorithms, um, that we'll use VQE as um, the example to motivate um, this uh, shortcoming of many near-term algorithms. Okay. Um, so we'll dive a bit more into the algorithm of VQE. Okay, so variational quantum eigensolver. Uh, I guess I should say any questions at this point? I guess it's, it's early on. Okay, so why are people interested in the variational quantum eigensolver? Well, um, this quantum algorithm may be useful for predicting molecular properties or material pr properties of quantum materials. Uh, these include predicting binding strengths, reaction rates, molecular pathways. And it makes these predictions via the um, determination of the ground state energy of the Hamiltonian that represents the molecule. So the VQE algorithm boils down to estimating the ground state energy of a Hamiltonian. Um, in the past few years, there have been a number of high profile experimental demonstrations of this algorithm, um, showcasing the fact that it can be uh, implemented on today's devices. And um, in parallel, there have been some substantial improvements in um, the algorithm itself. These come in uh, a number of different features um, of the algorithm. Um, you may recognize some of these, uh, these techniques. Um, we like to refer to these as like the VQE Pi. So in trying to like tighten down all the bolts and improve the performance of VQE, um, you might wanna swap in and out uh, components um, to see which gets you the best performance. So despite all of these advances, um, there is still no evidence in the literature that VQE will ever be able to outperform state-of-the-art classical methods uh, for predicting molecular properties. So why is this, why might VQE um, uh, not live up to its promise? So to answer this question, we'll, uh, oh yeah, I, or in other words, this will quantum advantage machine use standard VQE? Um, so, to dig into um, why this might not be the case, um, we'll, we'll explain the algorithm in a little more detail. So VQE relies on the variational principle for estimating the ground state energy. So how it works is that um, a wave function is prepared on the quantum computer representing the electronic uh, structure configuration uh, or the configuration of the electrons of the molecule. And the energy um, of this state can be estimated making measurements on the quantum curve. The wave function preparation is then uh, tuned variationally to minimize the, the measured energy. And um, the minimal energy that is found is taken as a proxy for the ground state energy. So this optimization or minimization occurs in a loop. So after the quantum state is prepared, um, you know, in sequence many times and measured, 
the measurement data is used to provide estimates to certain expectation values. And then these expectation uh, values are uh, post-processed classically, and the results uh, determine how the algorithm should update the state preparation. This loop is carried out until, say, a convergence criterion is met. Um, so one kind of sneaky place that can um, really slow down this algorithm is in the estimation of these expectation values. To carry out uh, estimation to sufficient accuracy can require many measurements, many repeated circuit preparation and measurements on the quantum computer. So how is this quantum expectation estimation carried out? So we, we refer to this technique as standard sampling in VQE. So the goal is to estimate this expectation value. And the way it's carried out is that the state is prepared and measured, say, in that poly basis um, to receive an outcome 0 or 1. And much like flipping a coin to estimate its likelihood of heads, um, these, this batch of uh, measurement outcomes are used to predict the expectation value. So as we collect more and more measurements, our confidence in the estimate uh, improves. So we can visualize uh, this improvement um, with the panel in the top here representing the relative um, likelihoods of the various values of probability of heads. And as we play this video, with each measurement uh, outcome, the uh, width of this peak is narrowing. And the profile of the narrowing of this peak follows the well-known 1 over square root of n um, uh, um, decay that's well known in statistics. So there we go. Okay, in the end, oh, it's a little bit off. Okay, um, so goes, so goes uh, randomness. Um, okay, so this leads us to uh, what some people call the measurement problem, or maybe we should call it like the lesser known measurement problem. Um, and the issue is that because these measurements are made sequentially, um, the time required to achieve a certain precision is also related via this one over square root of t. And this uh, is uh, unfortunately fairly slow. Um, and it's important to point out that um, this bottleneck is, has nothing to do with errors on the quantum computer necessarily. This is a mere statistical phenomenon. And so it would occur even if you had a perfect quantum computer running BQE. So it's the, the slowness of this, um, uh, the rate at which our confidence improves that could be a bottleneck um, for VQE achieving quantum advantage. So is there any hope for improving upon this? Um, I imagine many folks at Sydney are, are well aware of how, how you could do so. So indeed, you can change the scaling um, by using one of the oldest tricks in the book uh, known as quantum phase estimation, or maybe in this case, it would be more appropriate to call it quantum amplitude estimation. Um, so this technique allows for a 1 over t scaling of this precision or ac accuracy. However, it comes at the cost of requiring very deep quantum circuits in order for it to be implemented. And today's devices are unable to implement such deep circuits, making this method a bit out of reach um, for use in practical problems. So, is there some middle ground that can be found? Um, you, know, you could imagine uh, requiring uh, circuits to not be so deep um, 
at the cost of the scaling not being quite as good as quantum phase estimation. So indeed, um, very recently, there was some very exciting work coming out of um, the out of Riverlane um, by Dao Chen Wang, Oscar Higgett, and Steve Brierley um, in this paper where they introduce this alpha VQE technique. And it does just what I was saying. It allows an interpolation between these two extremes. So this is uh, promising for a way to um, uh, uh, continually improve the VQE algorithm. So um, I wanted to give a little bit more context for where this result came from. So I'll present the uh, clean and linear history that led to this. Um, so alpha VQE uh, can be thought of as a combination of the efficient Bayesian phase estimation technique and the operator estimation technique by Neil Ortiz and Soma. Okay, these, the efficient Bayesian phase estimation, uh, as far as I understand, was a follow-up from um, Christus Foray's faster phase estimation. And I guess these two were probably heavily inspired by the uh, Kitai's original quantum phase estimation. Um, however, it's, I was, uh, surprised to find that two extremely relevant results um, for the faster phase estimation algorithm seem to just be in parallel um, uh, without being, being referenced as it goes in science. Um, and these two actually not bitter have- bitter at all. Don't worry, I'm not bitter. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, yeah, I guess these two have some deep Sydney roots. So I think this uh, second one here was done by some folks uh, in the Sydney area, and then I guess Chris is Chris is now that now there. Um, and I'm not so familiar with this area, but probably um, these techniques were inspired by old I don't know like Carl Caves ish, uh, Howard Wiseman metrology. Um, yeah, if you want to go down the rabbit hole, uh, you can go all the way back to the 70s in Hellstrom. Uh, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, no, so really interesting, right? It's like you're, you're kind of doing the same thing, but it was like different lineages, which um, eventually merge. So to add another, add another to the mix, um, our work can be seen as um, a merging of many of these previous results with the fixed point Grover search um, technique introduced by Yoder, Lo, and Chuang, um, or maybe more appropriately, um, like the uh, uh, I don't know, block encoding methods or signal processing. Um, okay, yeah, Chris, maybe at some point I, I would like to go down that down that rabbit hole. Okay, so um, given the previous results, the approach that we took was uh, what we would consider a more bottom up approach. So the question is, given the noisy quantum devices that might be realizing quantum advantage, how can we optimize the rate of information gain and amplitude estimation um, to uh, drive us towards quantum advantage? And so the principles that we use were to try to incorporate the effective errors in the algorithm design, as some of these previous techniques had done, and to try to maximize the rate of information gain with the available resources and also to try to uh, like trim the fat where possible. So for example, removing ancilla qubits if they're not necessary. Okay, so any questions at this point uh, before I go into the, the final part of the talk? Yeah, I mean, probably lots of you all knew this stuff well, well before I did. Okay, so um, I'll introduce the, the uh, concept of enhancing information gain from a slightly different perspective. So that perspective is starting from the standard sampling technique used in BQE. So 
Remember in standard sampling, you simply prepare the onsot state and measure, say for example, in the, in the poly basis of the poly operator that you want to take the expectation, estimate the expectation value of. So to arrive at uh, an enhanced sampling, what we can do is introduce a few circuit elements before making this measurement. So we'll apply the poly string as a gate, and then we'll effectively apply a reflection about the initial state. Um, and this is constructed with uh, conjugating a reflection about the all zero state with the onsots. So this sequence here has a flavor of a Grover iterate. It's the uh, product of two reflections. And indeed, um, what we'll take advantage of is effectively a, a type of um, quantum amplification. Um, so after, this, uh, after these Grover iterates, we'll, we then measure and again receive um, one of the two outcomes for that poly string. Um, I want to point out that compared to some uh, previous implementations, this is not making use of any um, ancilla qubits uh, necessarily. There are ways to, to do it, say, if um, you want to measure an observable that's not just a, a poly string. Um, but I think crucially, we would always put that, uh, those controlled um, gates for the measurement just at the end. Okay. So the question here is, um, while in standard sampling, it was very straightforward to make use of this measurement data, in the case of enhanced sampling, um, it's not so clear how we should process this data. So the answer to how to process this data lies in an object called the likelihood function. The likelihood function describes how likely um, an outcome is or a set of uh, data is given the parameter of interest. And so we can see here that while in the standard sampling case, you had this uh, linear likelihood function, enhanced sampling has this uh, nonlinear function. And uh, you could imagine then that for small changes in the parameter of interest, it could yield large uh, changes in the observed probabilities. And so this is a hint that um, this uh, non, this like updated likelihood function um, could be more informative about the parameter. So in particular, this likelihood function uh, takes this nice form. And um, with respect to the expectation value, um, the likelihood function is what's called a Chebyshev polynomial. Um, and so we will call this type of likelihood function a Chebyshev likelihood function. So how do we make, how do we use the likelihood function to um, eventually come up with an estimate for the expectation value? So with each measurement that's made, um, the data, oh, these came up, okay. Um, the data, um, we take in our prior beliefs about the parameter um, and we reweight them according to the likelihood function. And this yields then the uh, posterior distribution describing our updated uh, beliefs about the parameter. Um, this procedure can be repeated over and over again until the posterior is sufficiently concentrated around the true value, or sufficiently concentrated. In practice, we will adopt this, um, I don't know, for lack of a better phrase, Gaussian approximation method, which I think was um, introduced in some of these earlier papers. So this is where um, instead of keeping track of the posterior in full, we will approximate it in each step as a Gaussian. So um, how does this uh, uh, enhanced sampling perform compared to a standard sampling? Well, again, we can play this movie and the peak in the enhanced sampling case narrows much faster than that of standard sampling. So it would be nice to have a way to uh, characterize this improvement. One way to do so is the Fisher information. So the Fisher information describes how informative a likelihood function is about the parameter of interest. 
Um, and like maybe intuitively you can see that it captures the sensitivity of the outcome probabilities to the parameter of interest through this derivative. So if we plot the Fisher information um, versus sample count, we see that there's a 9x information gain per sample in the case of enhanced sampling. So yeah, I'd, maybe I'll pause here and just say that with this pretty, pretty simple modification <clears throat> to the VQE state preparation, one could um, uh, achieve a boost in um, uh, the rate of information gain. Um, should be noted though that <clears throat> Um, while this is 9x per sample, um, each of these samples costs a bit more time because the circuits are longer. Maybe roughly if you squint, <clears throat> they're longer by a factor of three. So you can imagine there being a 3x uh, in the information gain rate. Okay. Um, and if we plot this uh, Fisher information versus the, uh, versus the various true uh, values, we see this um, 9x improvement. Okay. So, of course, we were interested in um, how to enhance information gain, um, not on an ideal device, but how we do so in practice, taking into account these noisy devices. So, to do so, we will introduce um, a very simple noise model, um, which we refer to as the circuit layer depolarizing channel. Basically what this is, is a, uh, with each Grover iterate, um, we take the implemented channel to be a mixture of the true um, Grover iterate and the completely depolarizing channel. And so by combining these in sequence, um, the output state is simply a mixture of the intended state and the completely mixed state. Um, you, know, you, you might think that this is a fairly coarse uh, noise model, and it is, um, but one thing that is working in our favor is the fact that in the end, what we really care about is not what the output state is, but it's what the likelihood function looks like. And uh, you know, for a, for a given true value, the likelihood function is simply um, a number. And so um, it seems plausible that the effect on the likelihood function of noise is to attenuate it. Um, and I should point out that this noise model is very similar to ones um, used in, um, in previous uh, results. Oh, I kind of botched it with these animations. Okay. So um, using this coarse noise model, um, we see that the, indeed the likelihood function is slightly attenuated. Um, but surprisingly, the Fisher information can drop dramatically at certain points. In particular, at these places where the likelihood function becomes flat. We refer to these locations as information dead spots. Carrying out inference um, in those cases would be fairly, uh, fairly slow. So how might we get around this issue of these dead spots occurring? So we drew inspiration um, from this fixed point quantum search algorithm and this methodology of resonant equiangular composite quantum gates, where they, um, uh, in the fixed point search, they allow for tunable angles in the Grover uh, reflections, um, so as to boost the probability of if the uh, fraction of mark states is unknown. And you can see maybe uh, this squiggle in this uh, graph here, um, has the, has the look of a likelihood function. Um, and so this led us to the idea of tuning the likelihood functions um, 
using what we call these engineered likelihood function circuits. So instead of simply implementing these uh, full reflections, like in the Grover iterates, we allow for a tunable, tunable parameter. So with this, um, we can, uh, you know, going back to this uh, simple example, we can set these angles in such a way that at around this dead spot, we can produce a likelihood function um, which has a much more favorable Fisher information, even in the presence of some error. So any questions at this point? So how strong are the errors? When you, you, you're watching the errors track your circuits really well, how strong is the error? So um, yeah, maybe going back to this, uh, are, are you saying in this particular example? Uh, or in or in general. Uh, so maybe so I think it, in this particular example, maybe it was considered that the um, the parameter was like 0.99 or something, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or 0.9. I'm not sure if that answers your question though. No, it does. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Peter, I had a question about the um, ha this engineered likelihood function. How, how do you so you're at, you're adding an additional gate here? Is that so? How? Right. Yeah. So you you will end up uh, introducing more gates in order to implement this. Right. Um, so, so for example. You know, maybe it was nice previously. You could just implement this poly string with these local gates, um, but now you would have to, you know, uh, construct this full um, exponentiation of the poly string. And then similarly, although I guess in, in the um, generalized reflection about the um, all zero state, um, I think this is you don't introduce much. Um, uh, circuit depth. I think, you know, you can just make one of the uh, gates in that construction tunable. Okay. And the, this, and the tuning is done, like, is it done adaptively or, or is it just fixed? So, okay. Good, qu good question. I think, um, I, I'll make that clear on the, uh, a bit later. Okay. Um, thanks. Yeah, you could imagine that if you were forced to do this kind of optimization in each step, it could be very costly. So um, we try to avoid doing that. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll point out though that some uh, a setting where um, you wouldn't be introducing deeper circuits um, would be if the observable that you're interested in estimating expectation value um, was itself um, already like requiring some kind of um, uh, um, like deeper circuit that was implementing it. So something other than uh, other than a poly string. Um, right. Okay. So. Um, Going beyond these uh, so-called dead spots, what we find is that um, engineering the likelihood function um, for each of these values of pi can have the effect of smoothing out the uh, profile of the Fisher information um, compared to that of the Chebyshev likelihood functions. So uh, I guess for the last few slides, I'll talk about some simulations that we did uh, of this method. Okay, so how do we carry out these simulations or how does the algorithm work? <clears throat> and I guess this will get back to Chris's uh, question a bit. Um, so uh, given some initial beliefs about the parameter of interest, these are used to choose the circuit parameters um, 
of the engineered likelihood function. Um, those circuit parameters are then fed into the run circuit and measure um, to obtain measurement outcomes. Those are used to update the, the um, uh, probability or update to a new posterior. And then again, these posterior parameters are fed into the choose circuit parameters function. So I think one question that uh, Chris might have been getting at was like, hey, are you um, fixing these circuit parameters or do you have some means to choose them on the fly? So we can choose them on the fly, but moreover, um, what we do is to generate a lookup table um, that takes in um, values of the mean of the prior, prior distribution and the width um, or standard deviation and output the circuit parameters. Then while running the algorithm, we can simply call that lookup table so that we don't incur too much of a cost in this loop. I know Chris, if that, if that answered your question a little bit, a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. Um, so for some simulations of this, um, uh, we considered a case which has like 12 qubits. Um, we imagine that the onsat's depth is about 12. Um, and we consider the case that the two qubit gate fidelity is like not too unrealistic for today's devices. And um, we try to answer the question of, as we increase the number of layers of this Grover iterate, which of these layers will uh, yield the best performance? And so what we find is that as you increase the number of layers from one to two to three to four, um, engineering likelihood functions with four layers in this case achieves um, the uh, fastest reduction in, um, in the error. And then if you go past to uh, using five layers, the amount of error has built up too much so that it, it becomes unfavorable to keep increasing that circuit depth. So um, thinking back to the quantum advantage machine, um, it will be useful for us to have a model for the performance of this method. Um, this will allow us to take um, problems of interest and predict um, how long it would take the uh, quantum advantage machine to perform estimation with them. So we arrived at this model. Um, I encourage you to check out the paper, try to poke some holes in it, and um, uh, like let us know what you think about it. Um, but the, the model is uh, featuring this interpolation between the uh, shot noise limit scaling, which is uh, the case of standard sampling, and the Heisenberg limit scaling, which is that of quantum phase estimation. And the interpolation here is now not in terms of some um, fixed parameter, say, for example, in the um, alpha VQE work, but it's tied to um, the device characteristics. In this case, the two qubit gate fidelities, or more generally, this uh, circuit fidelity parameter P. So um, to test uh, how well this model captures uh, the performance, we ran some simulations changing this circuit layer fidelity, and um, in this case, plotting the median squared error um, as, a, as a function of, or uh, versus the runtime. Um, and these uh, up and down facing triangles indicate the uh, upper and lower bounds of this model. And we find in many cases, uh, uh, this is the case of true expectation value 0.75. Um, we see that the performance being um, in between these two bounds. So finally, imagining uh, the point at which we might achieve quantum advantage. Um, 
we could consider uh, what will we demand of this um, quantum advantage machine in order to outperform state-of-the-art um, classical methods. So um, imagine uh, that the number of qubits, will, we'll say logical qubits will require is 100, two qubit gate depth of 200, and we'll consider the task of estimating expectation value of a poly operator. Uh, and doing so to a few different target accuracies. And we'll consider a range of two qubit gate fidelities. So the question is, as the quality of this device improves, how should we expect the runtime of estimation to change? So here's a plot of, of these um, runtime models with the bands indicating the upper and lower bounds. And we see that the, uh, in order to get the run times, maybe uh, on the order of seconds, it will require this machine to be implementing two qubit gates with fidelities of over um, five nines. So this is indicative of the need of some uh, degree of quantum error correction being implemented. Um, however, um, the degree of quantum error correction that needs to be implemented um, may not be as severe as um, some other estimates predict. predict. Um, and we hope that this runtime model could be useful um, in determining you know, just how much um, uh, or how little error is uh, required um, in order to achieve a target uh, runtime in estimation. Okay. So Peter, to conclude, you, yeah, yeah, please. So this is this is showing the the runtime of your algorithm, right? This is showing the runtime of the model of the algorithm. Oh, of the model. Okay, so that includes like. That includes like exploiting the, this trade-off somehow optimally. Uh, tr what trade-off? Well, so I, I, I guess you, you found like the optimal um, number of layers, like uh, where where like the layers start to turn around. Like in the one example, you had like four to five was actually detrimental. So you wouldn't go beyond four in that in that example, and so you you would just stay at four, and then you'd be limited by shot noise, rather than um, like Heisenberg limit. Is that how it works? Yeah, I so I would say unfortunately, um, unfortunately, as you go to much larger examples, um, it can be very it can be like harder and harder to like predict exactly. Um, how many layers to use. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I don't want to, I'm wary of promising that um, like that optimization is carried out um, sure. perfectly. Um, um, but the way that we do it is um, basically uh, predicting what you expect that information gain rate to be. Um, and um, seeking to optimize the a model of that information gain rate. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, and maybe yeah. One thing to to point out there is that um, the thing that we aim to optimize is um, not the information gain per sample, but rather the information gain uh, per time. Um, and right. yeah. Yeah, um, um, yeah, this can improve, of course, improve, improve the time over simply trying to um, optimize the information gain rate per sample or gain per sample. Um, okay. Um, so we are hopeful that this um, approach um, to improving the performance of VQE can be an antidote to this measurement problem, at least eventually. 
Um, and uh, this shows how you could convert an improvement in the fidelity of say the two qubit gates into a time savings um, for um, algorithms. Um, the, some of the simulations that we did show that this um, could be carried out on today's devices. Um, and this technique um, could be useful not only before like uh, substantial fault tolerance, but also into the regime of uh, substantial fault tolerance. And as an outlook, um, right, the, the reason we may uh, care about this is because the algorithms that this can speed up um, have um, may be useful in a number of uh, commercial areas. Um, we're excited um, by this technique potentially guiding um, the design of devices. You could imagine that on devices they uh, explore trade-offs between um, gate speed and gate quality. Um, so by anchoring um, this trade-off onto uh, the algorithm performance, it can help you uh, nav or find an appropriate balance. Um, and finally, um, I believe it's, uh, this work highlights the uh, utter importance of having good noise characterization um, on quantum devices. Um, and you know, I know this is something that folks at, at Sydney uh, care quite a bit about. Um, and this is some of the um, uh, ongoing or follow-up work that we uh, are, are doing. So with that, thank you. Um, I don't have a clock accessible, so I, for all I know, it's been like three hours. Um, but I, I'm hopeful that we have some time for questions. Um, yeah, thank you, Peter. Uh, we have plenty of time uh, for questions, in fact. Great. Um, yeah, maybe bef before questions, I, I want to say that, uh, give a shameless plug that at Zapata, we uh, will be hiring in the, in the near future. And so for those students interested in uh, postdocs or full-time positions, feel free to reach out to me or talk to Monica about uh, what it's like at Zapata, if you want all the, all the dirt. Okay, um, excited to get into some questions. Questions. It'd be awesome to, to see people's uh, faces or at least Zoom avatars. Yeah, um, I have, yeah, quite a few. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, I, I, I the, the one that's most rec uh, like recently on my mind because you said it in the last slide was this noise characterization. Um, so you said that you were, uh, I guess, the point you were trying to make is like with better noise characterization, you can have better models and then optimize these protocols, right? Yeah. 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 I think. One thing to think about might be, uh, it's kind of a catch-22, right? Because how do you characterize noise? Well, you have to actually estimate expectation values. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like the same problem, right? Um, so I'm wondering, have, have you thought about, rather than utilizing good noise characterization to help improve the algorithmic performance, but applying the algorithm for noise characterization? Mm. Um, uh, well, I guess, first of all, no, um, not really. Um, but um, one thing that it seems like is required of characterization is that you, um, you I guess you like know uh, what to expect or you like have a baseline. Um, so, right, I guess, what we are considering is that <clears throat> point where you've like, I don't know, like left the nest. Um, like 
you know, it seems like it's like estimation all the way up or estimation all the way down, but it's like at some point you, at some point you like decide to leave the nest and, um, I don't yeah, know, I like mean, I, I can certainly fully unknown. I can certainly imagine some sort of iterative um, protocol where, yeah. So the accuracy here um, is always dominated by, in, in the end, like how accurate your model is, and that includes how accurate you've characterized the noise sources, mm -hmm. and then, um, and then. When you go and you ask, well, how do I characterize noise better? Um, you know, you need you you need like m a more sophisticated algorithms to to get more accuracy out of the the noise characterization protocol. So it's I think it's kind of um, it it kind of goes hand in hand. So you you know you characterize your noise better that allows you to you know control things and perform your algorithms better. And once you can do that, then you can characterize your noise better and, and it kind of goes back and forth. That's kind of the picture I have in my mind, but I don't know if anyone's actually formalized that. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I think this is a, this like transition from the point where you're like um, uh, doing noise characterization to, um, implementing the algorithm is like a pretty juicy interface and like I feel like there should be like some overlap between the techniques that could be used um, um, yeah so I, I hadn't really thought of using this technique for the purpose of noise characterization I was more selfishly thinking like hey man just tell me what the noise model is um, for this likelihood function Uh, just to say here that um, Chris, uh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, a couple of months ago, we um, I talked to uh, Jonathan Romero from Zapata, and uh, we have an ongoing, we have a pending, a pending collaboration about this noise characterization uh, in terms of non-Markovian noise. So, yeah, we will start. I'll start contacting him soon, and we can we can start this. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm also happy to um, facilitate there at all. Cool. I'll tell Jonathan that he should um, get back into it. Yeah, actually, I, th I don't think he even knows that I, I finally, so when I applied for this fellowship, I contacted him so that we can, because I already knew him, so we can uh, start something and put it in the application. And I don't think he even knows that I got it finally, I got the fellowship. <laughs> So I will just send you an email just to tell you what's happening and that we can start uh, talking soon. So yeah, and thanks for your talk, Peter. It was very nice. Thank you. Actually, sorry, I, I, I can't tell who's speaking. It's Christina. Um, Christina. Yeah. Oh, That's Christina, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I think we met in Italy a few years ago. Ah, OK. Sorry, I don't remember. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. In Verona. I probably have less, I probably have less hair now. It's, it's not your fault. <laughs> that was in Verona, in QTML. I see. Yeah, cool. All right. Um, can I, uh, can I like plant a question in the audience? Maybe like, I don't know, I feel like this is Simon's wheelhouse a bit. Um, Absolutely. Or probably other people. Um, one thing I'm, I'm super interested in, um, understanding better here is um, how these methods will interact with like state-of-the-art um, error correction techniques. So I don't know, uh, I feel like probably other people here, but at least Simon has quite a bit of experience there. Any, any ideas for, for what should be done? Well, as, as usual, it's about minimizing non-Clifford counts as much as possible, because I mean, even if you're implementing just a minority of error correction, as, as your last plot show, if you're just looking to, to bump up your effective logical error rates by, you know, maybe three nines up to five nines, um, you're immediately going to increase resources by probably a factor 
factor of about a thousand. And all of that's coming in primarily because of ancillary costs for, for non Clifford rotation. So when you sort of say, okay, we're going to, what was it, a factor of three increase in the circuit to um, inverse and then invert? Um, how complex are those circuits in the context of non Cliffords? Is there a lot of arbitrary phase rotations, things that need solvate cate of decompositions and stuff like that? Um, because simply increasing my sampling and simply running more and more iterations on a smaller depth circuit that has less complexity in terms of non Cliffords might end up being a much better option. Yeah, um, I think uh, the question of like um, how how long or like the time increase in these error correction um, overheads seems to be relevant here, right? Like you could imagine um, that if it's if it's saving you so much on um, error rates, it's coming at the cost of increased time. Um, so one thing that uh, we're excited about here is like maybe this gives you kind of like a an anchor with which to say like um, you know improving the fidelity this much is only worth it if if it doesn't take more than so much time. Well, I mean it's it's one of the things in your last plot that I thought was interesting, and the fact that the the raw circuit you're talking about bounds on the order of minutes and hours. Is that correct? Me. I don't know, are you still able to see the yeah. slide? Yeah, so here. Um, so you've got, you know, bounds of one second, one minute, one hour. What, what gates, what fundamental gate speeds are you assuming here? So uh, this is assuming like, um, uh, maybe it's like Google-ish Google rates, I guess like- Okay, so tens of nanoseconds. Tens, yeah, I think it's 10 nanoseconds is the... Right, well, I mean, you, you're going to... I mean, error correction is going to lose you a lot in terms of time and the fact that these might become unfeasible even if they worked accurately. I mean, again, you lose three orders of magnitude off the bat. So, okay, what's 3,000 minutes in that case? And is that then reasonable in terms of uh, computational time? So, okay, well, it's 50 hours. I mean, that's not too bad. I guess one thing this this graph doesn't take into account is the uh, this increase in time due to error correction overhead. So it would be super super interesting to me to come up with an updated version of this, where you're saying like, hey, each each nine that you want um, costs you this much more time using this particular method. Um, I don't know. You could even imagine maybe there being. Um, yeah, it feeds back in sort, of non -com in sort of non-trivial ways in the sense that, you know, as, as you increase, you know, you, you do some error correction that increases the effective depth, which is um, the probabilities of errors, which means you've got to increase code distances to compensate, which then in turn increases effective depth. So it, it's a weird feedback procedure that you've got to look at um, to get good numbers. I mean, you know, rough ballpark is a factor of a thousand. That's just, you know, it's a good rule of thumb if you want a quick calculation in your head, how it actually impacts the circuits. Oh, you can do it. It just takes a, a, a fair bit of effort. I mean, a lot of the stuff that, that the Google group and, and Dominic does, where they'll get like Austin or Alexandra on the paper too. And so sort of the back end of the paper talks about error corrective compilation. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's done manually at the moment, which takes a long time. Yeah. And if it's done manually, it's let's tweak this parameter and try it again. Wait, Simon, you said uh, like rule of thumb is like multiply by a thousand, uh, multiply by a thousand. Roughly speaking. To... What's that? Yeah, yeah. Roughly speaking, if you invert, if you multiply by a thousand, it will give you a rough ballpark. So multiply by a thousand in order that what? Oh, in this particular, well, first of all, error correction overhead, even to give you an extra nine or two nines is going to increase computational time by ballpark factor of a thousand. 
And so what about with each additional nine? Each additional nine. So you're looking at increasing by distances of three. So for each additional nine, you'd probably be looking at maybe another factor of seven. Depends on how far you are below the threshold. Hey, well, at the very because least, the difference in your physical error rate, or the difference error rate and your threshold determines how much you gain every time code distance. So if you're a factor of 10 below threshold, every increase in code distance by three gives you roughly an order of magnitude error rate. But if you're two orders of magnitude below threshold, a distance increase of three can drop you by three orders of magnitude. So it ultimately depends where you're sitting physical error rate compared to the threshold. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is it is it naive to think that on the right hand side here where you're demanding um, uh, very high fidelities that if you incorporated the time required to implement those that you would see a, instead of a flat line you would see an increase in runtime. I'm trying to get at do you think there might be like some kind of like uh, minimum if you incorporate uh, quantum error correction. No, I don't think so in these plots. If we scan from left to right, in terms of what is the required two qubit cape fidelities, then it should be monotonic. It shouldn't be, there shouldn't be a, a, a minimum in there. Um, everything will just shift up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. Well, thank you. Okay, this was a really good discussion. It's uh, always good to see when people from UTS like to enjoy a conversation with a speaker. And there's a sign of Peter giving a really good presentation that really struck the chord with uh, several of our men members. So thank you again, Peter, for finding the time and uh, preparing this all for us. Plans and um, questions, it's, it's a surefire way. <laughs> okay, so yeah, if you would like to talk to Peter, later I'm sure he would be uh, happy to have conversation with any of you and uh, yeah uh, that's the end of the talk thank you guys for attending yeah thanks everyone